an archaeologist. I'm here on behalf of the um, Centre for the Study of the Inland, which is a group similar to this centre. It brings it's a multidisciplinary um, study area, mainly um, centred in the humanities, but reaching out to others as well. So my talk, learning from past environmental change, I'm not actually going to tell you that the past is there to serve as a lesson for us about what to do and not to do. That's not always very helpful. Mostly we learn from our own mistakes, and if history teaches us anything, it is that we generally ignore the lessons that it might have. So when I was thinking about what to talk about this morning, I kept coming back to the title of the centre itself, which Andrew has just explained for us, the Centre for Future Landscapes, which is such a fantastic name. Um, what I want to do is to talk about those words, future and landscape, and share some thoughts about how we might think about connections between the future and the past. So I'm going to start with future. And actually, I'm going to think about futures in the past. Imagine a past that is not a static, dead, or remote place, but that is actually the future. Think about a past in which our present <coughs> was the future, because that's what history is. It is a collection of presents all strung together. All those people in the past whose actions led to where we are today, they didn't know they were living in the past. They were living in the now. And the futures that they saw were just as strange and troubling and exciting and frightening as the ones that we face now. One of the futures that some people faced on this continent 200 years ago was the Anthropocene. Yes, I'm going to use that word. What do we really mean by Anthropocene? Well, it's a relatively new term, but it already carries a lot of cultural baggage. It's a shorthand for a terrifying new epoch in which the whole environment is changed because of human action. Air, water, ecosystems, everything that we know that is familiar is damaged, altered, or about to be gone. Well, that's exactly what happened 200 years ago in Australia. The Anthropocene is how Curry author Tony Birch describes the arrival of European colonists with their herds of sheep and cattle, their crops, their iron axes, their mines, their fences and cities and changed fire regimes. All of a sudden, everything that was known <coughs> as fixed and reliable and constant suddenly disappeared. The rivers, the plants, the animals. That's definitely not the future that Aboriginal elders imagined in 1780, but they and their descendants somehow managed to live through it. That's one of the futures that is contained in our past. It's a future where events are beyond the control of those experiencing them. Their only agency is in how they're able to respond to it. Another future in our past is the one imagined by the diggers of the 1850s. This was a future that changed a sheep walk into a bustling modern city in only a few decades. William Withers was one of those early diggers. In 1870, he sat down to write the story of Ballarat. He looked around him and wrote in wonder about a place that had been only wild bush when he arrived, but was now a city larger than those he had known in England. He observed that Ballarat had a population greater than that of Oxford and Cambridge combined. Having lived through such momentous change, Withers could not begin to imagine what the future might hold, but he was certain it would be good. He wrote, in less than two decades, we have created a large city, built up great fortunes, laid the foundations of many commercial successes. We may look with confident hope toward the future. If anything, Withers and his contemporaries were actually surprised by the future they had created. It wasn't what the diggers had planned when they started out to make their fortunes, and it certainly was not what the worried intelligentsia in Melbourne had expected. This was a future that was the unexpected cumulative effect of short-term individual choices. This future came about by accident rather than by design. But looking back, once it was the past, those who experienced it saw the pattern of what they had done and were content. This is another kind of future, the unintended future that is the consequence of actions which together put people and society 
on a particular trajectory. Some benefit from the futures that result. Others point to the environmental costs and the social costs and urge restraint. But once begun down that path, it often proves impossible to turn back. Then the main choices become how to impose controls that provide the best circumstances for the most people. So these are just two of the many futures in our past. How does this past that is full of futures help us to imagine the possible futures for our descendants? And I'll come back to that question in a moment. What I want to do now is turn to that other word from the center, landscapes. Unlike most of you, I'm not very strong on the non-human world. Birds and grass and trees and possums and ants and so on. But as an archaeologist, what I do know a lot about are human landscapes and how they change over time. One thing I know is that landscapes are human by their very definition. There are no empty spaces on this continent, and there haven't been for 60,000 years. There are no spaces that are devoid of meaning and memory. There are only richly peopled places that have been occupied and managed for millennia. My expertise in archaeology is to read those landscapes, to see the layers and the juxtapositions of all the human hands and the human actions that have shaped a place. I look at this campus and I see how the line of the ring road sweeps around the old dairy that was once where the medical center is now. I see the rows of trees in the wildlife sanctuary that were planted by the returned soldiers who were sent to Mont Park after the First World War. I see the billabongs and the wetlands that were here before that, and the yam fields that were tilled by the Wurundjeri women with their digging sticks. I see that past in the present. And landscape is about all these layers and how they fit together. The term landscape comes from art, from Renaissance painting. The first landscape was painted by Dutch artist Jan Vermeer in his view of Delft in 1660. Vermeer was the first to stand back from the detail of human activity and paint the big picture. He took people out of the central focus, but he didn't get rid of them. He painted a town, Delft, the product of human hands, and the water, the very human canal, in front of it. People were still important, but they weren't the only characters anymore. By the 20th century, the term cultural landscape was being used in the social sciences. In the 1920s, the geographer Carl Sauer coined this term cultural landscape, and he was deliberately critiquing the prevailing dogma of that time about environmental determinism, the influential intellectual position that human action and culture was determined by the environment and the natural world in which people lived. Sauer argued that it wasn't that simple. He could see the profound role that people play in actively shaping the environment around them. So Sauer's cultural landscape is a composite that integrates the non-human elements of climate, topography, plants, and animals with the actions of people. So what are the landscapes around us, and how have we shaped them? Andrew's already um, given a bit of uh, insight into that. This is where I respond to another part of the brief to draw on my experience and research about past change. When I read a landscape and see the layers of the past, I see a record of former actions that created the foundations of the present. And I want to illustrate this with a couple of quick case studies from southeastern Australia. So this is Lake Mungo in um, southwestern New South Wales. And many of you are probably familiar with the remarkable Aboriginal history of this region, which was brought to prominence in the 1970s by the discovery of ancient ancestral remains. Mungo Man and Mungo Lady are now known to be more than 40,000 years old, some of the oldest ancestral remains anywhere in the world. This region is now the subject of ongoing research by one of my colleagues in Center for the Study of the Inland, Nicola Stern. Nikki returns to Mungo every few months to record the surface archaeology, flip flakes of chipped stone, um, fish and animal bone, eggshell, hearths that lie on the surface of the land. Nikki records the evidence of human lives from before the last glacial maximum. The ancient um, age of the, that evidence is remarkable in itself. What is even more remarkable is that Nikki doesn't actually have to excavate any of this. 
the sites appear by themselves as the layers of soil and sand are stripped back by the wind. Every time Nikki and her team of students and traditional owners return, they find something new that has appeared since they were there last. They record what they can, and then the wind <coughs> erases it again. These sites are revealed now and then destroyed again because of European actions over 100 years ago. Land around Mungo was let as pastoral leases in the 1860s, and um, people entered with sheep, uh, with mainly sh um, herds of sheep, pastoralists. Good years through the 1860s and 1870s saw stock increase until 50,000 sheep were grazed on the station. But then the rabbits made their way in, and the drought of the 1890s changed everything. The environment collapsed, the land was overgrazed, and the erosion began. And Nikki was telling me yesterday that they've got um, recent evidence from um, pollen cores in some of the soaks that tie the um, increased erosion in that landscape definitively to the last 200 years and the onset of grazing. So a century later, the consequences of those few decades and that particular activity are still being felt all over western New South Wales with poor soils and exposed <coughs> gibber plains. And I have to say opportunities for archaeologists because um, these sites are being um, it revealed by the wind all over western New South Wales. <coughs> so the erosion um, that began then has, um, is now creating this archaeological record that archaeologists can study. So that's one example of past action that shapes a current environment. Another ca case study of past environmental change is the box iron box forest of central Victoria, which is probably known to many of you. This treasured natural region is also the product of a series of human interventions in the past 150 years. Have you ever stopped to wonder why so much of it is still in public hands? In the 1850s, this region was the heart of the gold rushes, and it's, the gold is what gave it value to the society of the day. When the gold rush began, the land was still leased from the Crown. Under the Land Acts of the 1860s, the big pastoral leases were broken up for sale, but not on the gold fields. That land was too important to sell off, and instead the government created a series of gold fields commons. So this image here is the region around <coughs> Calthamain in 1860, just before um, the Land Acts began to sell off the land, and all of this um, blank space in there um, is the area that was uh, set aside as a goldfields common. And this image up here is Sandhurst or Bendigo, and the red line outlines the goldfield common that was declared around Sandhurst. The goldfields commons kept the land available for mining and also for other uses, including timber getting. This is um, Forest Creek or Casamain in 1858, and you can see the upheaval in the foreground along the rivers as the um, people were doing the mining, but the most important thing um, probably is to look at those ridge lines and the hills in the background and how few trees are there. By the 1880s, almost all the forests of central Victoria had pretty much been cleared out. Mining companies around Castlemaine actually got rid of their steam boilers because firewood was too expensive. It was cheaper for them to run their equipment using water from the Coliban system. In response to the timber sh shortage, the government set up the Creswick and Ballarat State Forest in 1882 under the supervision of bailiff John Lagersh to start managing timber more effectively. Over time, those goldfields commons were nibbled away through private sale and the remnants were converted to, state reser to forest reserves. Now those reserves are the basis for our state forests and the box iron bark woodlands. But all of those trees are much less than 100 years old, and, they many, and many of them still have coppicing evident. My final case study of past environmental change continues that theme of mining. If mining ended up saving the forests in a roundabout way, it destroyed the rivers. Rivers all over Victoria were choked with mining waste. That sediment is still in the river systems, often stored in the floodplains. The Rivers of Gold project, which I'm directing at the moment, is a multidisciplinary team that's carrying out research to determine just how much sediment was produced, 
where it was and where it is, and what the implications might be. So far, we've done detailed research on part of the oven system in northeastern Victoria and on the Lawton Valley in central Victoria. And we're planning to look at the Lee um, Valley south of Ballarat next. I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but this is um, some calculations that we've done from documentary <coughs> records about um, the amount of sediment that was produced in each um, mining division. And um, the takeaway from this is that all of that sediment went directly into the rivers. What we're finding is that sediment load has driven a number of significant changes in the river systems. So you can see here this is on the Lawden River around Eddington. Um, all of that there is post-sediment alluvium, much of it um, from the mining period. And uh, my colleague Ewan Sylvester, that many of you will know, um, is here uh, taking soil samples uh, for uh, XRF analysis to look at the chemical signature of those. So what we're finding uh, then is that this sediment has created a lot of significant change. It filled the water holes of the previous river systems, it covered the floodplains, and now it's incising because of a lack of sediment supply. Yeah, I'll turn this way. So you can see that would be the original river system up there with lot this sort of the string of ponds um, with occasional deep water holes. During the mining era, all of that was filled in with the mine tailings, the sludge, and flooding took place over a much wider area. And then this is the current river system that is being cut down um, by um, incision and leaving those former water holes and the former floodplains um, buried beneath that layer of mining sediment. We've also discovered the impact and extent of dredging across um, the Victorian River network. And dredges were large industrial factories, basically, that worked thousands of hectares of floodplain around the state. Um, their reach extended up to 40 meters below the surface, and they churned up everything in their path in those thousands of acres. Um, there were attempts at remediation at the time, but we estimate now that nearly three quarters of that dredged land is still only good for forestry or scrub, and only about 10% is used for cropping. The significance of that is that these are the alluvial river floodplains, the best land in the state, and only 10% of these areas that were dredged are now used for their best purpose. Um, this paddock here near Newstead is a classic example. It looks all right, but actually that was dredged, so 40 meters um, depth of that was completely churned over. Um, now it's basically just unsorted gravels and talking to the land owner there, um, they graze it but they can't effectively plow it and they notice that big sinkholes appear um, in that land periodically uh, because it's just so unconsolidated. So what these case studies tell us is that the non-Aboriginal disruption of the Australian landscape starts much earlier and was far more profound than is often realized. The disruption is now so naturalized, if you like, that it's often invisible to casual observers. This means that ideas of setting a fixed baseline for restoration or management are really not that simple. Our brief today asked us to look to the future, to think big, and to be visionary. What kind of future would we like to see in the next decade? Being a historian, I tend not to think very well in decades. I tend to think in centuries. And being an archaeologist, I'm even more likely to think in millennia. I think we should imagine the future in those terms too. Not us, not even our children or our children's children. In the words of Cherokee author Daniel Heath Justice, what kind of ancestors do we want to be? And this takes me back to where I began with a past that is full of futures. The futures of all of those who have come before us. This is where the past and the future are very similar. They both last a very long time. For me, this is one of the most important lessons about the past. It gives us perspective. We are not the first people to walk here, and hopefully we won't be the last. So when we think about the future, my hope is that we will take that long view. People in the future, 500 years in the future, We'll, we'll, think that, we'll see that our generation is still part of a transition from the Australia of the previous 65,000 years to an Australia post-Captain Cook. The environment and the society that li we live with today 
are still adjusting to that massive disruption of that other Anthropocene. Now I'll come back to my earlier question. How does this past that is full of futures help us to imagine the possible futures that we might face? Well, imagination is the first step. All of those past futures happened because people imagined something new. Endless plains of flocks and herds, golden wealth, prosperous cities. It didn't always work out the way they expected. And sometimes it went badly wrong. Other people in that past, in those pasts, imagined futures with forest reserves and rivers free from sludge. And they slowly were able to work to achieve those dreams. For better or worse, all of those imagined futures were what they chose and what they worked toward. We need to do that too. We need to actually see what we want to achieve. We have changed this land already too much to enable us to go back. And that's something that we can learn from history. We're not the first people to change the world around us. And we're not the first to struggle with problems that we've created and problems <coughs> that have been created for us. The environment will continue, will continue to change because it always has. Some of the changes will be because of our conscious choices and the actions that follow from them. Some of the changes will be unintended consequences of human intervention in non-human systems. And that has long been the case too. We can't undo the consequences of that other Australian Anthropocene, but we can't think of our present as the end either. Someday this will be the past, and our future will be someone else's now. We are only temporary custodians, but we can imagine a future to be proud of as ancestors. Thank you.